This is the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast. The following contest is scheduled for one fall. Let's go nuts! It's Jimmy Nuts! Five out of the door! With your host, Mark Martinez. Because I'm the Mark. And I'm awesome! The Guru. Today I'm going to break it down for all you simpleton sweat hogs listening out there in Can Crusher Nation. I don't mean to come out here week after week and toot my own horn, but toot, toot. And the English Professor. It is I, the English Professor from the County of Kings, speaking the English of the Queen. Hey, this is former WWE superstar Duke, the Dumpster Drossy, and you are listening to the Can Crushers Podcast. And welcome back to another Can Crushers. I can't even get excited because this week has been a horrible week, and legitimately, three minutes prior to recording, I had to delay it because shit went wrong in my house and where I was. But welcome to the show, the glorious guru who is in studio and the English professor in his humble abode, gentlemen. And I use that loosely this week. How you are? Great. Um, yeah, that intro, I got to be honest, was a bit of a dud. Usually it's like, and yeah, welcome. But yeah, you're, you're not feeling it this week. Nobody is. It's January in Pennsylvania. It's miserably cold. And wrestling this week as a whole was miserably bad. Yeah, your your intro was it, it was lackluster. I mean, you guys know somewhat of what happened prior to the show. I'm giving you guys. Let's talk about the week. How in life, John? How was your week? How was work, Chad? How was your week? Did you fucking kill a snake in the middle of the woods? Anything cool like that? Because prior to today. My Odroid is where it needs to be. It's going to be back by next week. I'm going to have it fast and ready to go. I've discovered a new wrestling game that I can't wait to buy next week, and I'll talk about that in the third segment. Leading to today, going back to an old job that's a new job that's cleared my head was amazing. It was legit Two to three hours before the show, leading up until three minutes before we were supposed to record, I have crashed and burned. Wow. <laughs> Literally! This this was one of those weeks. Um, I had a good week. Vinny had a good week in school, which was good. Um, I know Sue doesn't listen to this, so I can get a hold of it. His teacher's smoking. <laughs> it's just that simple. She she is a really pretty young lady. Um, yeah, wrestling sucked. Wrestling wrestling really sucked this week. It sucked a lot, especially everything that we everything that we watched. John, your week? Yeah, Sil uh, By the way, Sylvan's kindergarten teacher. He's he's in fifth grade now, but his kindergarten teacher five years ago was good looking lady. On that subject. Uh, You're down one already. First of all, I just want you to know that I, I had to have several of Dad's beers at his house. So. Oh, God. Oh, what, what are we drinking? Let's talk about that for a second. We have Miller Lite out the ass. I have a 30-pack in the fridge. In the fridge? Fridge? In the fridge, and Chad brought down bottles, which I, I'm going to tap into the bottles as soon as I'm done with these ones on the table because I like bottles better than cans. I really do. What are you drinking? Uh, uh it's um, Elliot Ness Amber Lager from uh, Great Lakes that. Brewing Company. I love that. I yeah, had that a ton good. when I worked with the Seawolves. We actually had that on tap. Oh, I drank that during the game. I mean, after the game. Right, yeah, because you were working during the game. Right. Yeah, so you weren't drinking during the game. I love this. Yeah, I'm on uh, my last two. I just brought them both into the office with me because I know I'll drink them both during the show. Nice. My I week was all right. I I'm trying to... I'm trying to read more, guys. I'm at a place in life where I'm I'm looking for uh, – I'm at peace with myself and those around me, but I'm looking for a greater peace. And I promise you I won't get political, but I think you guys can agree. Historically, 
we have gotten, not just the three of us, but throughout history, man has gotten along with his fellow man pretty well until the powers that be uh, dangle a carrot or a shiny object in between us and have us fight for it. That's all. I'm trying to read about, like, the revolution and, and stuff like that. And, I don't know, people historically got along pretty well. There are always lousy people out there. But there are always good people out there, too. So not a lot has changed. You we guys have, are good people. Thank <laughs> you, John. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, Thanks. We got to we gotta talk about a couple of... Well, wait, 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 wait. Not, no, we're not... We're, I know where you want to go. Well, I, no, I, I'm, uh, there's some good and, and you know, I, no, some I, passings and that that we need to talk about, too. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I want to echo what John said. Um, and you guys, John will laugh. Chad will uh, uh, probably agree with me. I've read two books in the last legit month, and one was the Lance by Chance book, and then one was the Bobby Williams book. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them immensely. You guys have heard that on the show. So I'm actually going to take time and read the books that I purchased that are just upstairs. Great. I, I have a lot of wrestling books, and if there just had to be wrestling books that I'm going to read... I enjoyed those two, three days that I was reading because I disconnected from, um, no disrespect guys, we love Can't Crush Your Nation, but I would, dis I would disconnect from the internet. I would disconnect from even playing video games, which is a major part of my life because it helps with my anxiety and everything. But the, the reading took me to other places that I haven't been. Um, I've never enjoyed reading um, through high school or through two college appearances or anything like that. And my mother always read because she enjoyed it. And it, it took me maybe a year to think, huh, maybe this is something I should do. Uh, the Lance by Chance book was, uh, was amazing. The Bobby Williams book was amazing. I recently purchased... And I didn't tell either one of you a Harley Race book and an Arn Anderson book that are just sitting over here that I can't wait to read. So I plan on uh, Chad's giving me a finger already. No, no, I was going to say the Harley Race book. I know what one you're talking about. It's a good book. I I can't wait to read them. So I need to say all right Tuesday nights from you know seven to nine before I go to bed or something. I'm going to designate that as reading time. So, John, I agree. I I, yeah. I think it's it's where I need to be right now, and it's great. All right. So, Lance by Chance is so good. I blew through that. It's not a knock on others, but, like, back in the day, I read Bobby Heenan, or I read Freddie Blassie, enjoyed them, enjoyed the wrestling stories. But you wonder, like, how some of it connected to other parts. Like, Bobby Heenan's book was just a bunch of gags and funny jokes and stuff. And Lance by Chance – blew through the whole book in a couple of sittings. Um, it just flowed together very smoothly. I'm not just saying that because we had both of them on the show, the writer and, and the subject, but uh, uh, it was really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Oh, that looks awesome. King of the Ring, Harley Race. Love it. Oh, that's great. Arn Anderson forever. I got both that's of nice these. Stuff. I got both of these for five bucks, just to let you guys know. Yeah, wow. I got I got to laugh. You talking about your mom always reading? I I remember your mom and mine at times exchanging what I used to call the smut novels. I I ended up <laughs> throwing. Um, if anybody the, around here knew that I had a huge book sale, I legit had more than a million books for this book sale. I remember that making uh, making a ton to help pay some bills and everything when I did sell them. Um, Ending up donating a lot, and then, oh yeah, some of these older ladies that came into the book sale for my mom look, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh my God, Helen had that!" And you know, and uh, when I say smart, oh, no, it they was were, a, they were outright it was, smart. It was it was the quote unquote romance novels <laughs> that <laughs> had some lady getting on it. They had some lady getting bent out a freaking window while the guy's dressed in a suit behind her and oh you know my what? great my greatest love of the it's century true. stuff it, John oh my god this stuff there was like a bunch of 
the older ladies, and I say that respectively, our parents and that Mrs. Picciarello, your mom, my mom, there was a Joe Fowler, Lyle mom. that lived up on oh, yeah. Rock Street that would it was like these books were exchanged. It was like a like a little fucking cult. smut cult <laughs> slash club. Yeah. Of these They started out this here. way before Oprah had any book club. Yeah. Any wow. book club. Alright, so do you guys want to know why I'm a bit salty and you guys have already calmed it down a little bit? Go ahead. So Kelly Kelly tells me on Monday after she comes back from work that, hey, I think my brakes are bad. Cool. All right. Fine and dandy. Um, let's switch vehicles, you know, and, and see what happens tomorrow. All right. So I back out two inches out of my driveway, taking Kelly's car to work at 5 o'clock in the morning, which is like 4 o'clock on Tuesday. And just backing out, you know, you, you can't back out 90 miles an hour. You shouldn't, at least, like some people do. So I back out on the Route 219, and I hear... <laughs> so you know it's metal on metal. Ooh. All right, awesome. All right, Kel, you're going to take my car to work this week. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll drive yours in town so you don't have to go far, bad, this, that, and the other. We'll head up to Dad's on Saturday and change the brakes. Hey, Dad. You know, I get out of work Tuesday. Hey, Dad, we're going to come up. We're going to change the brakes. Cool. I was just going to ask you to come up, too, and put all the Christmas decorations up above the garage. Because he's got a huge-ass garage where the Christmas decorations go. All right. We'll be up Saturday at 1 o'clock. Great. Sounds awesome. Cool. 1 o'clock. I'll be there. We text about five times. Still good? Yep. Yep. Got the brakes? Yep. How much did I charge you? Told him, yep. Good. Got a great price. This, that, and the other. Awesome. Hey, call me right before you get here so I can open the garage so, you know, you can pull right in and not let the heat out. Fucking fantastic. We'll do that. We get up to the summit. Call him. Dad, we're at the summit. We're going to be there in like two minutes. Cool. I'll be out in the garage waiting for you. It's nice and warm. Great. <laughs> pull into his fucking driveway. And it's been snowing since goddamn last week. Somebody hasn't left his house since last week, apparently. And normally Dad cares that if there's one flake, he's got to go brush it off or whatever. Kelly has a front-wheel drive. Yes, not an all-wheel drive. Dad's got three feet of snow in front of his driveway that he decides... Fuck it. I'm not leaving the house. I don't have to do anything about this. So pulling into the driveway, <laughs> Kelly's car bottoms out. Huh, what's wrong with this? Why didn't it pull in? Dad, you got three feet of snow in your driveway. All right, let's push it into the garage. All right, cool. Push it into the garage. Great, we do that. Dad, don't you think we should... uh? Get rid of that snow at the end of your driveway so when we leave, no, you'll be backing out. You'll be able to be fine. Cool. All right, whatever. I don't know a car worth a fucking pen. We start backing out. We end up in his yard. All right, cool. Let's push it out. Nope. It's just digging in deeper. Dig it in deeper. I tell the guys then, hey, we need to move to 8 o'clock instead of 7 when we normally record. Fourth wall's coming down on the show today. All right, awesome. Send them a text. <sighs> guys, I'm actually stuck in this driveway now. Now we are full-fledged stuck in this driveway. Um, and I mention all this because during the couple hours that we're up there and everything, uh, my dad and my stepmother are avid listeners to the show for the first 25, 30 minutes before we get into wrestling because they like to know what's going on in our life when we don't talk to them all the time and everything. So none of us thought, huh, we got stuck going in the driveway. Why don't we get this goddamn snowblower out, blow it out of the way in the five hours that we're up to? No, we just decided we're going to drink beers in the house. All right, cool. You good to go? Yeah, we're good to go. Here's a new lamp for your podcast room, which is working great, by the way, Chad. Don't you like I noticed. Yeah, it's yeah. Great. Yeah. Nice. great. Looks good. So we back out. Now we're in the neighbor's yard. 
because the car, as I was backing out, just slid sideways. Son of a bitch. Kel, get in. We'll try to push you. You know what? It went back three feet. Into the six feet of fucking snow that's in his driveway. What are we going to do? I, I don't know, Dad. Now we are stuck. And now we're running out of gas. Because we went up with like 30 miles left on the gas thing. We're like, ah, oh, we're going to Kersey, which is six miles away. This, that, and the other thing. The car's running now for an hour. Just burning gas. Kelly's, yeah, 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 when we're stuck. So it's just burning gas out. Awesome. Awesome. This is even better. Wow. Huh. Do you think I should hook the truck up and pull you out? Otherwise, we're doing the podcast here and we're sleeping over until June. Yeah, that'd be great. So he hooks the truck up to the car. I'm watching the tension because, no disrespect to Kelly, I love her, or Ethan because he's just learning this stuff. How much do I have? Dad's rope is from here to... Johnsonburg, which is seven miles, guys, long. Dad, keep going. He moves a foot. Is that tight? No. You, you, you moved an inch. Oh, okay. So Dad's down the road. Kelly hasn't even moved yet. Kel's yelling out the window, which way do I go? Straight until you get out of his driveway. Okay. Kel gets out of his driveway after the ass end turns around six different ways. She spins it around. Awesome. I disconnect from our car. Kelly takes off down the road. Shit. Dad's now backing up. I'm, I'm yelling at him, wait, what are you doing? I have to back up so the tension's gone. Kelly's down the road already. You don't need to do anything. He's backing up. How close am I to your car? Dad, you're not close to my car. Kelly's legit down the road. I unhooked her in the meanwhile. How much room do I have? You're disconnected. Just throw it in the back of my truck. You don't have to wrap it up. No shit. No shit. Dad, I love you. Thank you for pulling me out. And I hope you're not mad. I have beers for you later. But next time we come up, one, it will be in my car. It will be all we'll drive. And if you don't have your fucking driveway plowed, we're going to go down to the neighbors, turn around, and go home. He knew since wow. Tuesday, since Tuesday, that we were coming up because we had to go up to change Kelly's brakes. It's it, Kelly's car's clearance off. It, it's almost like a low rider, right? Kelly's was, clearance isn't six inches. But, you know, with all this, was the garage warm? No, it wasn't then because when he saw us coming from the summit, he opened it. So... All the heat that was in the garage was now out by the time we pushed Kelly's car into the garage. So we put the Christmas decorations away in negative 30 degrees. Kelly and Ethan are bitching, it's cold in here. Yeah, no shit, because Papa Poopa had the goddamn door open for 35 minutes as we were pushing your car out of the neighbor's ditch. Good thing he had cold beer. That's all I have to say. Cold, you know they say cold beer. Re- Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Cold beer and um, oh, what's the word? Uh, friend, not friendly ship, uh, camaraderie or something at the house today was was key. We did get the we did get the brakes changed though. Nonetheless, that's, that's important. Yeah, that's good. If you're starting your truck right now for two hours later, go fuck yourself, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 not yet. You know how they say you shouldn't. Like, read a tone in a text, just read the words. You guys, you can read a tone in Mark's text. He, he didn't say much. He just said, we're going at eight. And I could tell, ooh, Mark is not in a good place. <laughs> and then he said, stuck at my dad's or something like that. And I was like, this is really not in a good place. So I said, let's just get up early in the morning. And then sometime later, he wrote, no. Red in five or read in five, but he left out the Y and ready. And I was like, if he's not that he's like, you know, an English major, right? An English major, thank you. But uh, <laughs> if he's you know, type quickly leading letters out and misspelling stuff, he's pretty upset. But I'm glad 
you know, I, we were able to be therapy for you and soundboards for you. You are. All right. We'll send you our bill. Yeah. yeah. Uh, apparently, I have a towing bill coming pretty soon, too. I don't, I don't know. Probably with the way you're spinning in the fucking neighbor's yard, you're going to have a repair bill, too. Well, I, I know I know a place I can get dirt and sod now, right. and I can okay. just cover that up easily. Thank you, Ridgeway Burrow. Um, all right. Now, yes, we, we do have sad news after that. I'm already happier than when I left my dad's house. <laughs> it, it might be the two beers that I had coming down the hill. Don't drink and drive, by the way. Don't drink and drive. You cover the baseball. We, You're uh, more of the baseball. Yeah. Um... John, how do you want to cover this? Because there, there's several people that uh, still consider him the home run king because he does not have any uh, asterisks. Uh, my whole thing this, or since I heard of it, was um, the first thing that came to mind was long live the king. Yeah. He is the home run king. He was classy enough that when Bonds hit home run, whatever, 750 something or other, Seven six six. Uh, yeah, he he had a recorded message that they played at the ballpark. Hank Aaron did. Even though, you know, people have their suspicions about Barry Bonds and and how he did things. Um, Hank Aaron still, you know, put together a congratulatory video. Um, guy put up with a lot of crap when he was playing, all because he was challenging uh, a white guy's record that stood for a long time handled it with dignity grace and just kept hitting the ball um and from what i've heard that that old cliche but it applies here first guy on the field last one off um first guy at practice last one done practicing incredible mind for the game i heard bob costa say if he let off with a double and didn't advance, let's say, you know, next three guys went in order, he could peek in from second base and have the opposing catcher's signals and sort of cadences deciphered, like leaning a certain way, leaning the other way, where he put his glove or whatever. He had it figured out and brought it to the dugout with him. Incredible baseball mind. Um, incredible specimen and athlete but an amazing mind for the game as well. Yeah. Um, we're speaking about the passing of Hank Aaron. Um, he hit that home run off of Tom Browning, right? Is that is that what I remembered, number 755 to break? The, well, it wasn't 755 then. It was 714? 715. Like 715. 715, yeah. Off of Tom Browning. And they, they brought Tom on to MLB Network this week. And just the way that he talked about Hank hitting that. And a lot of people don't like giving up home runs. Tom's like, it was my pleasure. You know, <laughs> it was, it, 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 you laugh, but no, it's, you know, it was my pleasure for him to do this. And he spoke that, you know, Hank was the, uh, the, the professional of baseball. And if anybody should still have this record and never be broken, um, it should have been him, you know, in, until this day. It's like, uh, Cal Ripken Jr. having breaking Lou Gehrig's record of the Iron Horse of playing so many consecutive games. You know, Garrick was awesome, but Cal just taking it to the next level. You know, nobody wants that record to be broken because Cal Ripken was so big to the baseball and so was Hank Aaron. So I personally, um, in a book here, in a book there, yeah, Barry Barnes has it. But I think of Hank Aaron as the king, like John said. Yeah, I, I got to agree with you guys. You guys follow baseball more than I do. But... Um, because somebody's not convicted of something, you know, whether civilian life, pro sports or whatever, doesn't mean they're not guilty. And through Barry Bonds' trial and stuff like that, he just didn't give anything to say he was not guilty. He, you know, to towed the line. 
He didn't go one way or another, and you, you lose a lot of respect. And I'm sorry, these records, you know, like that one that's, you know, was broke or the uh, most strikeouts in a in a game. Um, back then, it was, I don't want to say the balls weren't juiced or stuff like that. It was, it was all natural back then. You didn't have the shit going on. So, yeah, there, there's an asterisk besides Bonds. I, I don't think anybody can honestly admit that there's not. Um, Hank Aaron's, you know, the king. That's all, I mean, that's that's all there is. Uh, he did, you know, as John said, he was a very professional man. Um, even though he had reservations about Bonds and everything like that, he still congratulated him. Yeah. But... You know, there's there's records in other sports. I don't want to say compare to this, but I think Emmett Smith, you know, leading rusher of all time, was Emmett Smith better than uh, Barry Sanders? No, not even close. He just but, lingered around enough. But Barry Sanders, you know, quit, and Barry Sanders was like, I don't, I don't want the rushing record. He was like, that's, you know, so-and-so's mark. I don't want that. I, you know, all respect to Hank Aaron. He he was the king. He he did it without any help, with, you know, the steroids being juiced up and everything. And I kind of think of him honestly um, related to our wrestling. I think of him the same way I do of Bruno San Martino. Natural strength, did it on his own. Didn't need the bullshit. And you can't, you know, the the baseball community lost a a pioneer. Um, Good word. One of the few people uh, in pro sports all around that you can really look up to. Um, you know, that every everything he did for the um, African-American community and everything he fought... If there's somebody you want to look up to, that's somebody to look up to. And then we had um, – oh, go ahead. Two, two, two quick points while we're on the subject. Um, do you guys know a pitcher that absolutely – this is what he's known for. And you do know him, literally know him, who owned Barry Bonds. Bonds' lifetime against this guy was one for 12. That one was a home run. No walks. This guy pitched for the Pirates, but also for the Dodgers. And when he was a Dodger, he was brought in as a late-inning specialist to get Barry Bonds out. I got a double off of this guy when we played Legion Baseball. So you, you Well, I was going to say you did better than Bonds, but Bonds hit a home run. What right. was your, did you ever get another hit off of him? I don't remember. I know I, I got a double, double off of him. Uh, yeah. yeah. We, we played high school. We played Legion Baseball. Um I, I could drop his name. I oh, we were going to. I, I'm just gonna say I could go to a local establishment and have a beer with them right now if I wanted to. I I, I will consider myself. I want to say friend, but acquaintance that we know each other, and it's Joe Bimel. Yep, look him up. He he had a major league career. Almost got to a couple of World Series with the Dodgers in uh, oh oh eight oh nine when they lost to the Phillies. He was on one or both of those Dodgers teams, I believe. Played with several other teams as well. Yeah, yeah, he played with a bunch of teams, but he was a Bonds specialist. Uh, and then this is wrestling related. Uh, Sweetness was in Razor Ramon's corner. Where is he on the all time? Because he was up there on the on the all time rushing list, right? Walter Payton. Yeah, Walter Payton yeah. was the one that had the rushing record, and Bonds. Okay. No, I, I, Smith. No, uh, no Bonds. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Um. Barry Sanders quit before and retired, said no, he had too much respect for him to to take the record. And that, you know, at first people were like, oh, you just don't think you can beat it or you can last long enough. Well, there's a difference between staying around 25 years as a utility player in getting a record versus somebody that, you know. This is a debate that everybody will say. I mean, Emmett Smith was behind hogs, big-ass guys in Dallas that got most of his stuff. 
Barry Sanders in Detroit were behind me, you, Sylvan, and Vinny. And John. Detroit did not have linemen, a quarterback, wide receivers at that time. Uh, the quarterback was Rodney Pete, Andre Ware, Scott Mitchell. Uh, I look them up. They're garbage. Yeah, he, he he was the offense, and he still got fifteen hundred yards per year. Yeah, he, he just decided I want my life after football. Peace out, yeah. Cub Scout. And he had he. People were just like, stay around for a year or two and you'll have the record. That's not how he wanted to go about it. Right. And nothing against Emmett Smith. Great rusher. I know he said about him having the blockers and having the line, and it was... He went to Arizona. Bit, but he went to Arizona for, what, three years, four years, something like that, just so he could get the record. And to me, yeah, you have the record, but, you know, that's kind of like... <clears throat> John, you're gonna. I I hope you don't hate me for saying this, but that's kind of like you know your uh, eighth grade crush, and you screw her forty years later. Why? Why? But why did you? Because I, you when I make John comparisons like when I make comparisons like that, John's like, "What in the fuck are you doing?" Oh. Sometimes, uh, but it's like it's like, oh yeah, eighth grade. She was fucking hot. She was smoking. I loved her. I know okay, now she's very crush, but now I won't she's bring it up. fifty some years old, and <laughs> you're banging her. It's it's a uh, it's like kissing your sister. It just ain't the same. John, it's a married with children episode too. There you go. John's eighth eighth grade crush, like the song "I Saw the Sign." No, I'm kidding. Never mind. We won't even go there. <laughs> okay, we might want to no, talk. No, uh, we won't. No, that was just that was blasphemy. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, God, I want oh, you to got the baby. You got to stare from him. He's gonna beat your ass. Never mind. You're I'm not. trying to think of the girl. To be honest with you. Oh, never mind. We'll 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 bring it up another time. Start with a V. We talked about this earlier this weekend. In, yeah, uh, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, right. All right, the other one, the other one, um, passing away this weekend. It's a horrible transition that we're talking about right now. My God, um, one of the greatest, one of the greatest talk show hosts, Larry King, passed away as well. Yeah, uh, I wasn't much for talk shows and late night ones and that. I mean, Johnny Carson had quite a few moments, you know, but Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon were a team. Larry King just didn't give a shit. He did not, you know, he called people on the carpet when they were relevant, not 20 years after they were, you know, relevant or in the news. Um a lot of the people dogs are out going there. Nuts. I'm sorry. A lot of people out there in the you know news community, um, whether they want to admit it or not, learned a lot from him. I called into his show when Al Pacino was on there. I didn't get through, but I tried. I stayed in the line for a while. Nothing. He, uh, okay. no, he he was on a Turner station, and, and he had wrestlers on there occasionally. He did a very good episode. About Chris Benoit. He had Bret Hart, Chris Jericho. Boy. Um, I know Hulk Hogan's been on his show. Mark Merrow went at it with Steve Blackman, because Steve Blackman was still kind of working at the time. He was like, ah, things aren't so bad. And Mark Merrow's like, come on, man. The drugs are rampant and, and whatever. But he had wrestlers on there. He He tackled what other people were still like. Oh, is this fake? And they're talking to Captain Lou and Captain, no, it's all real and I'll fight you right now. Larry King was talking about more, uh, you know, more serious problems in the wrestling business than some of the other talk shows. And we should give a shout out to Don Sutton, too. Speaking of Dodgers pitchers and ball players that passed away in the last couple of days, Don Sutton, we lost him a few days ago, too. Yeah. Um, just two real, two real quick ones that I have on a more. Personal note, uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm a diehard Denver fan. Um, back in 90, 1998 and 1999, I was stationed in Wyoming. So I was in kind of about my heaven because I was an hour and a half north of Denver, Colorado. I was 45 minutes north of Greeley, Colorado. Why is that kind of news? That's where Denver held their summer camp. And fans could go down and watch, you know, watch these, the the Elways, the Sharp, uh, 
Ed McCaffrey, you know, all these guys. Terrell Davis. Terrell Davis. Um, and, you know, after every after morning session and afternoon session, they had players out there. Um, I say this because uh, Tony Jones, Tank, as he was affectionately known as, uh, that played for Denver for these two years and two more, um, vital part of their Super Bowl teams, uh, passed away uh, two days ago at the age of 54. Um, Tony was, he was a big old teddy bear. He loved the, loved the fans. Um, and I'd always go to these, you know, down to the uh, summer camp and stuff like that, or training camp, I should say. And he was the first professional athlete I got an autograph from. He was always sitting out there, you know, after the morning practice, if he had three-hour break between the morning and afternoon, he was out there with the fans for two hours in the morning. In the afternoon, holy shit, you know, he's gone through everything he's done, two-a-days, he'd still stay after practice. Um, love taking pictures with fans, you know, especially the little kids and that. Uh, a great loss uh, to the football community and a great, great guy. I don't want to say I knew him personally, but I looked over the pictures and stuff from that time and just a uh, nothing but a big old teddy bear. And I mean that as, as respectfully as I can say it, just a, a true giant in, you know, in every sense of the word, uh, loved being a father, uh, loved being a teammate, was heavily involved in, com in the communities, uh, especially taking care of the homeless and things like that, and I said tragically, he passed away a couple of days ago at the age of fifty-four. Yeah, the the good side. On a little bit upper note, Hobbit Hobbs, happy birthday today. Ho Hobbit Hobbs. Oh, I'm sorry, Will Hobbs from AEW. Powerhouse Hughes. Power Power Powerhouse Hobbit Hobbs, whichever. Yeah, happy birthday. No, all kidding aside. Uh, Will Hobbs, happy birthday. Um, big article about why he signed with that was great. AEW versus uh, WWE. That. Well, well worth the reading. Uh, congratulations on your success and happy birthday, big guy. So we're transitioning. So if this last half hour does not tell you how awesome wrestling was this week, <laughs> I don't know what will. Well, well, we covered baseball, football, the news, history. It, it it will go downhill from now. Yeah, and this was the good stuff, guys. And yeah, it. yeah. Just remember, well, I, I do. We do have some good stuff in the third segment that I want to talk about. I'm really right. excited about something that's out, and I'm Jones and they get it. And but we'll save that for the third. Uh, I'll let this go in order. Raw. Uh, we all have raw. one. Major bitch. <laughs> why? Oh, we all know why. No, I mean, why Raw? That's what. Well, why Raw? But why did Mr. Wrestling 2 come back with a inside out <laughs> mask? That looked more like an assassin's mask. Yeah, I was going to say, um, what the hell was his name? Dick Byer? He just passed away last year. He was like Dr. X or Mr. X. Whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what the hell kind of man? Why, 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 why was it inside out, first of all? It, why would they? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, were they trying to push that Randy Orton's burns were so bad and he was all, you know, caned and fucked up on the inside of the mask or what? But just like, I, you know, like it was, we talked off air, that mask was about 10 sizes too fucking small for his head. Yeah. yeah, it looked like it hurt it's, being on. Yeah, yeah. It just looked like he tanned too much, to be honest with you. That's all it looked like. <laughs> Did it look like his nose got redder as the promo the went the, on as well? The, the mask was squeezing his head so fucking bad. It was either going to be his nose or his eyes pop. I'm telling you, go back and watch that first 25-minute promo about Randy Orton. His nose just... I thought Rudolph was going to come out and dance on one of those TikToks pretty soon. 
Oh. What else did we like about Raw? It ended. Um, I love the Lacey Evans and Ric Flair angle. I do. Them walking together, and she says, tell me about that time with the four horsemen. Well, you know, honey. And then whoever it is comes in and interrupts to interview them. And then when the interview's over, they pick right up, and Flair's like, well, let me tell you about Arn, or whatever. It doesn't matter. The, the idea is there. Um, And then Flair versus Royce. I enjoyed that match. Um, Peyton Royce has kind of been on a bit of a win streak. Uh, she posted to Twitter some time ago about how she has wins over some pretty impressive names. And Charlotte Flair was just methodical in, in kind of taking her apart. So I enjoyed that. Um, AJ Styles versus Ricochet. What can he say? AJ Styles, he's incredible. He's on another level. He can't have a bad match. Ricochet is pretty good, too. I don't understand why this is an opportunity for the Royal Rumble. This is just burying Ricochet. Why not have 30 matches, then? So that 30 <laughs> people, That's the idea. It's a surprise. You don't know who's coming out next. Why does Ricochet not deserve to be in this? Because he lost to AJ Styles? Eh, that's dumb. The Gilbert thing, other than Gilbert, was great. The rest of that was a mess. Go ahead, Mark. You want to say something about this? I, I was actually excited to see Can Crusher alum Gilberg come out. I actually thought they duped me. I thought, oh, man, we're going to listen to Goldberg spit on the mic and tell me why he hates Drew and Drew had nothing to do with anything. When they brought out Gilberg, I thought, yes. And then I thought all of them were going to come out. I thought Goldberg was going to come out and Gilberg was going to get speared. And then they brought out... I don't know who Drew was. This guy couldn't hold a Wasn't candle. Wasn't that the guy from fucking NXT? I don't the know. The one that we all you hate. You made a better Drew McIntyre yeah, than this guy did. Gee, it, I popped when Gilbert come out. Honestly. I was excited. I was I was glad to see him because he is not. He has had some uh, health, health issues. issues in that. And I was like, holy shit, it's good to see him out there. And you could see that he was having fun. When that, who's, who's the guy in the NXT that... You know, was running away from fucking ghosts and shit and everything. Oh, Trevor Lee? No. Well, that's his real name. Um, uh, Grimes. Cameron, Cameron oh, yeah, Grimes. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought that was like Cameron Grimes' twin you brother. Know, twin brother or something like that that didn't make it over five foot six or whatever, but. Uh,. I, I actually am one. Yeah, well, we have to. We might have to break quicker than we thought because we're both running out of beers. Yeah. I actually enjoyed the the stupid breaking news thing with Triple H and them poking fun at each other of Triple H and Steph, and then who was it? John Cena, uh, Sasha, and who was the other person? Oh, Roman. Roman and Paul. I didn't mind that being hokey. Of announcing the next three WrestleManias, I didn't mind. I didn't mind that. That was fun. Um, that makes one of us. <laughs> Peyton, I I think they're burying her a little bit more. Yeah, she does have some wins. I'm a huge Peyton Royce fan. I'm all right with this angle too. I don't know. That that's what I got from Raw. Mandy and Dana. I want to mention them. They're going nowhere fast. Uh, They're going backwards. Yeah. Shayna and Nia Jax are amazing. I know they didn't team up or wrestle together or anything, but I just believe that they're two badasses who don't like each other and team up. They remind me of, like, two bruisers at a bar in Ridgeway who are always like, wow. Dickhead, you know I'd kick your ass. Chris ah, Severance. Whatever. Huh? Chris Severance. Yeah, and somebody else, whoever. Name somebody else. Doesn't matter. But, yeah, th that, that kind of idea. Um, you pay to see them fight. And, and when they do split, I hope the match is everything I imagine it to be. Because I think it could be really, really good. The downfall, John, I think Shayna has it. I know. I know you're in love. You have somewhat of a crush on Nia of some sort. I don't think Nia can carry this piece of paper in a match somehow. Wow. Yeah, I don't... I think what's going to be the best part of this match if they let them go at it is it's going to be a it can be a brutal match because they're two 
obviously Shayna Baszler with her background and everything like that can can take the big stuff. Um, and Naya, you know, I know everybody, you know, people get hurt and everything like that. She has that reputation of being uh, somewhat unsafe. I think it's due to her due to her size. Um, I don't think her talent is there. But this is just a match where they can two if it's just fist big cups, girls can great. beat the fuck out of each other. All right, let's transition to SmackDown. I'll let you guys go first, and I'll give you my thoughts on SmackDown because I really didn't mind it. Go ahead, John. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I watched Archie Bunker <laughs> and the Jeffersons. That's my Friday night show, and I've kind of given up on SmackDown. Oh, did you see that the uh, another sad news, the one that, uh, oh, the guy, one guy that played in Archie Bunker, he was, um, yeah, passed away. I, my, my brother tried to explain it to me who he is, and he didn't know his name either, but I, no, I don't know who it is. Uh, I just That's remember, true. I remember seeing the article. So you guys didn't talk about SmackDown when I went and got beers. There's yeah. nothing much to really talk about. Um, Sasha gets a... Uh, a match with... Uh... See, this is where... I, I will disagree with you guys. I actually enjoyed SmackDown this morning when I watched it. Not the Roman stuff. Couldn't care less about that. Uh, I, I, I saw Paul getting hurt and Roman coming out and just beating, and then I just stopped the match. I, I didn't care. I enjoyed... I really enjoyed the Sasha and Reginald thing as funniness. Of her struggling a little bit with uh, Reginald. My favorite thing was the stupid Bailey and uh, Bel Air obstacle course. I knew once they said Chad Gable was a helper that she was going to have to carry Otis across and more things were going to come out. They tried, at least. Uh, they tried, at least, is what I'm, I'm going to say. Um, again... It's maybe because those two are my favorite, and that's really, really why. I could give two shits that Dom got beat the shit by Corbin. I Dom has went backwards for me. When he was fighting Rollins and everything, and Rollins was carrying him, it shows that Rollins was carrying him. Right now, Corbin is nowhere near Rollins' level. <laughs> And it looks like Dom has uh, taken a back seat. The Possum King could in no fucking way possible. A, he couldn't hold Seth Rollins' jock strap. Um, Dom was, the way he was brought in was okay, but he was made to be more formidable than he should have been. He was given too much offense. Um, it's one thing to jump in the ring with a kendo stick, rescue your dad. Uh, but he was brought in too quick. But this this goes back to the booking. This goes back to Vince McMahon and his stupid shit of wins and losses don't matter. Who takes Baron Corbin seriously? Nate Who? Geist. Who the hell's Nate Geist? Super. Oh! <laughs> he takes Baron Corbin seriously? He loves him. Uh, I'm going to have to unfriend him and block him and report him on Facebook. Oh, all right. Kid and Soup. No. I had, I had respect for you when you were IRS, but if you're a Possum King supporter... All right, that's WWE for the week, huh? Minus yes. NXT. We'll talk yes. about NXT in the third segment. But right now we have to talk about Collar and Elbow. You got to take over Collar and Elbow this week. I don't want to talk about Al Snow right now. All right. I'm wearing my Collar and Elbow hoodie, which was a Christmas present for me. As I mentioned, it is January. It's January everywhere, but it's January in Western <laughs> Pennsylvania, which means it's especially cold. Shut up! Doing my promo. Uh, so I put my very comfortable... Um, collar and elbow hoodie on today around the house, and I have been very, very warm. It feels great, um, looks great. Guys, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweats. Uh, Chad, 
Can you tell them what the promo code is? Can Crushers. Capital C and Can, capital C and Crushers. Chad is wearing his Chad Gaspar shirt, as you can't see him on, but yeah. Um, It's January here, too, so... How Man, isn't that isn't that fucked up how it's January in Pittsburgh and January here? It's amazing. Holy shit. It's like we're in the same world Time or warm. something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 10%. So, go ahead. Go ahead I don't Tell care. No, say, just go ahead. Say. No, go ahead. Right. Go ahead. I just want to I want to talk about the pay-per-view. I'm excited. When you use that promo code that Chad mentioned, can crushers, capital C and can, capital C and crushers, all one word, you will save ten percent. Uh, let's forget about these three jabronis over here. Let's hear from Al Snow himself. Wrestling. A love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand. The wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. Well, let me tell you, brother, Ravishing Randy Hogan here, NWA WCW star, and I'm coming at you from the can crushers, baby. Mark and John, number one podcast in the whole world, brother. Let me tell you, old school stories, not the same info, not the same questions, coming at you on a regular basis. And what you going to do when can crushers and randomania run wild on you, brother? And welcome back to Can Crushers. It is I, the English professor, joined by your host, Mark the Mark Martinez and Chad, the glorious guru. And Mark, um, you gave us all a pay-per-view to watch, Heroes of Wrestling uh, from the late 90s. And before we get to that, that that got me kind of interested in watching some some different things. Um, I don't know why Mr. Saito popped into my head. But I just went to YouTube, I typed in Mr. Saito, and I, I watched some Mr. Fuji, Mr. Saito tag team matches, maybe late 70s, early 80s, when they were tag team champions. They were good. I mean, they were ahead of their time, and they reminded me sort of the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov from a few years later, where each guy had their own style, but they complemented each other. Like Sheik would do the suplexes, and Volkov would do the power moves. Fuji would do the chops and kicks. And Saito would just do the punishing ground and pound and mat wrestling. There's a reason it's called the Saito suplex now, because he just devastated squash guys with his suplexes. Really, that guy was legit. And when I read about him, he had all sorts of legitimate fighting credentials. Um, so anyway, I'm glad they- you told me about this pay-per-view, which was the shit, by the way, before we went any further. <laughs> so guys... I, I want to broaden my horizon. So if there's anything out there that you recommend that I watch, I don't care about era or geography or what. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see what else is out there. You know, if you find something in the 1950s that you think is good, tell me about it. I want to, go, I want to see it. You got to look up, uh, talking about Fuji and Saito, they had uh, two good feuds with uh, Tito Santana and Ivan Putski. And Rick Martel and Tony Gurria um, in those times. They had some really good matches there. Yeah, this pay-per-view was a drizzling shit. All right. It's like, it's like you know, wait, you go wait, to the... Stop, no, hold on. No, no, no. giving everything away. No, oh, no, not yet. This, this entirety was like, you know, you plug up your toilet because you go to the bathroom too much. You take crap too much. This stuff would pass through a fucking... Chicken fence, it was so fucking bad. But we're not talking about pay-per-view yet. We're talking about what we're setting John up for. Oh, oh that's, so not much, for that's not much better. Uh, go ahead. So, recently, Can Crushers has subscribed to IWTV. And there's, Chad, what do you think, the 200 promotions on there, right? 
You watched wow. a little bit with us. Uh, with me, I'm, I mean. I'm, I'm still going to counseling over it. So, we we have uh, an account on IWTV, and there's some great stuff. Um, Rise is on there, Shimmer's on there. I will always promote them because I love what they did for women's wrestling. There's some other great ones on there as well. But, in the next couple of weeks, John, we have, and we're not going to give it to you right now. Because well, we don't want to ruin it. Plus, you don't have the passcode or anything yet. Plus, we have a lot going on next week with the uh, Royal Rumble. And we have to cover our Royal Rumble the way that we would book it and stuff like that. But in about two to three weeks, we have a pay-per-view from IWTV that you guys can subscribe to as well. Um, $10.99 a month. Um... If you like wrestling, just, just subscribe. Uh, there's a ton of shit on there as well. It's awesome. Um, but we have a couple pay-per-views. John's a huge ECW fan. <laughs> so we're going to take it to the next level for John. Lower. And we'll, uh, we'll drop this one off that you guys can watch along with us. We'll make John watch it. And, oh boy! Yeah, just... It's kind of like going from the White House to the outhouse. Ming's on it, though. Yeah. Ming. 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 Is it like, like backyard wrestling type stuff? It looks like the the ring apron or the, the mat looks like some kind of huge animal that they killed it and stretched its hide. It also takes place in a junkyard. Yeah. Wow, you guys are really selling this to me. All right, I'll check it out. I will make sure you do. All right, so Heroes right. of Wrestling uh, took place October 10th, 1999. And as I said to these guys off air, if this was a card 10 years prior, it would be amazing. It took place in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. I have no fucking clue where that's at. Mississippi. In, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I don't know where Mississippi is. At Casino Magic, it is said to have 2,300 people there. That might have counted everybody three times. I am the nerd of technology on the show. It looked like it was shot on the very first VCR camera and dubbed back the beta. You mean, you mean like the like the westerns used to be shot where everybody and oh, the no. horses were bobbing up and fucking down? No, John Wayne's looked better than that. Oh. This looked like it yeah. was shot. Nineteen ninety nine. This is when it was shot. So there was no HD or anything then, but it looked like uh, even before reels. You you could have shot this on. Polaroid Instamatic cameras and done better? Yeah, this was horrible quality. And it was sold for like thirty nine ninety nine because the feed that we shared was on like Direct T V or Dish Network or whatever. Or or whatever. And it was outright horrible. What are you guys' thoughts on that first? Yeah. Everything you said, honestly. Maybe I got used to it, or the quality was a little better as the show went on. Um, <laughs> what quality got better? As the yeah, show I don't know. maybe I just got used to it. It was. Y'all remind remember that little viewer thing that we'd have as kids, where you'd put it up to your eyes and click the thing on the side, and you'd see different <laughs> scenes. That's about what the fuck this was shot with. <laughs> They just gave some. They just gave. I think Vinny probably could have shot better off of his tablet as a six year old than this thing was shot. Do you remember He Man when it was pictures and then there was uh, voices over a picture and it was switched to another picture and there was different voices in like 82, maybe? Absolutely. 83, yeah, absolutely. That was better quality. I think yeah. we've I think we've beat this 
Ooh, so we know shot. where I think we've been yeah. beat right. a shit shot to death. Um, I- I'll start off right off the bat as I-, I have this in the notes later in my notes. Gordon Soley was supposed to be part of this, and it was Gordon Soley ended up with uh, cancer. He pulled out, and they never made reference until later, and I have it in my notes when that Gordon Soley was even involved in this. So they throw on Roger Murdoch or whoever the fuck the other guy is and Dutch Mantel. Poor Dutch. And and we'll get into that later. So the first match of the night is the Samoan SWAT team against Marty Jannetty and Tommy Rogers. No, it was the rocker. Yeah, the Marty Jannetty. Yeah, Yeah. This manager, when he comes out, it, I didn't understand what he was even trying to sell us on. I didn't know if Tommy Rogers and Marty Jannetty were going to be the bad guys, or if the Samoan SWAT team were the good guys. I He didn't know. I don't think they gave these guys a, a yoda of what's going on. But this guy wins, this guy loses. Just go out and try to sell yourself. Uh, We'll all talk about our thoughts. Marty Jannetty, he had just left wrestling a couple years ago. He didn't have a pair of wrestling shorts. He was in jean shorts. Cut off. Um, (laughs) The advertisement literally... uh, Oh, wait. The advertisement is literally on the ring... And Janetti kicked it off because he didn't want it there. A slow match that ends quicker than nobody knew what was going on. And then I threw Dutch under the bus because he was just trying to do so much wrestling stuff. And the other guy didn't know a wrestling. He called it a reverse throwdown. Instead of... The... Go ahead. No, there was something, there was a leg drop or something. No, a drop that kick. Was later. Drop that kick. was later. Yeah, it was later. I know it was later, but he called a leg, a drop kick, a leg drop or something Fly, like that. Flying, flying leg kick. Yeah. 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 Dutch Mantel had to correct him. I'm surprised Ooh. Dirty Dutch didn't, didn't just start beating that guy's ass in this. I wish he would have. It would have been more interesting than the fucking match. Yeah. If, if you played a drinking game every time Dutch Mantel said, wait a minute, he'd be wrecked. Sometimes he interrupted himself. <laughs> well, I need to get out. The action's coming over here. I need to get out of here. Now, wait a minute. Uh, the match was better than I thought. When I saw the Samoans come out, I was like, holy shit. These guys are Yokozuna's cousins. I mean, they were out of shape. They could still move. I mean... <laughs> Those hip tosses, those those arm drags, they snapped into them. So that was surprising. Those guys could move. Um, I thought Janetti and Rogers looked looked good. They they still looked like good athletes. They moved around well. Story wise, I'll take that match over a Young Bucks match any that's, day of the week. Yeah, that's not saying much, but no, it isn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the Samoan SWAT team. I was, you know, holy shit! I, I for a minute forgot that this was well after they were in their primes. And these guys comes out, and you know, John, I'm going to disagree with you. You said they were out of shape. No, they were perfectly in shape. If a fucking hot air balloon was a shape, <gasps> these guys were huge. Holy shit! You want to talk about huge? We'll talk about the main event. Oh, yeah, that's a fucking barn burner. This was WCW's version of uh, the Samoan SWAT team, by the way. The, the oh. second version. The Head Shrinkers were Samu and Fatu. This was Samu and Fatu's twin brother. Um, what the hell is his name? He was a Samoan savage in WCW. Was it? Was it I can't remember. I don't care. Tama. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. The Tonga Kid. He was the Tonga Kid when he first started. John, we met him after this. When did we Absolutely. go to the big event? 2000... Yeah. 2000... What? I would have been like 14 or 15. 
he dropped 300 pounds. Yeah. Between 99 and 2014. What is that, yeah. like four and a half a fucking Isaac Swerve or whatever the fuck that midget is in eight? It's, in not, eight. it's not an Austin Theory yet. Austin Theory. He's like four and a half of him. I have something to say about him when I get to <laughs> A Samoan drop slash F5 type finish was interesting for the time. I don't think anybody had ever really seen anything like that. Good opening match. Better than I thought it was going to be. It doesn't get much better the rest of the way. Agreed. Uh, does anybody want to talk about any of the promos that happened in between? Like right now we're going to talk about the Sherry and George checking into a hotel and loving each other. and No? They were all generic. Tully Blanchard. What? We're not there yet. Has, okay. The ind- individual ones, I thought we were just going to go over all of them now. Okay. No. I, no. They, there wasn't anything special. They were just like, you know what? We're a brand new promotion. I'm trying to get myself over like it's my first day on the job. That's what they all were. Okay. Well, we'll get to the Tully one. I will talk about the Tully one. Next matchup is Greg the Hammer Valentine against George the Animal Steel with sensational Sherry in his corner. Why did the ref make George take his shirt off? Like, there's people wrestling today with shirts on. He had to take his shirt off in 99. And there's then... Fucking, there's fucking people today that ought to put their shirts over their heads. And then... There was never a reason... There's no storyline in this match that went back and forth. You just showed us that Sherry wanted to have ravaged sex two seconds prior to this with, <laughs> with George Animal Steel. And now they come out and she's raking his eyes. She's taking the thing back from him, giving it back to him, hiding in her bra. There was no consistency in this match. And We've heard stories about Greg the Hammer Valentine being kind of a rougher guy and, you know, just he's very by the business. Why did he agree to any of this? Like, George is this George. No disrespect to him. He's passed. We love him. This was just a shit show. I don't think anybody in the crowd knew what the fuck was going on. Yeah. Um... 14, 15 years earlier for the Intercontinental title. Incredible. Would have been fun to watch. Wouldn't have been a great match. Valentine was always very good. And he's talked about wrestling guys throughout his career who would just lie there and let him beat on them. Junkyard Dog, George the Animal Steel. It's like these guys didn't even have that in them anymore. I mean, they didn't even have the the shticks they used to do in them anymore. You know what I mean? Like... George, I feel badly because he's no longer with us. Valentine did okay. George Steele just didn't have anything to add to this match. I mean, not a thing. Choke the guy. Burn his eyes on the ropes. Show us some of that old George the Animal Steel stuff. The foreign object thing was neither here nor there. Ah, uh. I don't know what the fuck to say about this match. It, it was. And it wasn't I was the looking worst forward. Point. I was like, "Oh, George Animal Steel! Oh, holy shit!" And then you know the whole Sherry thing with the fucking hotel room reminded me of Dylan wanting to watch Flair bang Sunshine and Precious, you know, Precious, and wanted to do that. And I was like, "What the hell?" And then Ronnie Garvin in fucking drag. That was about the only difference is is that Sherry was an actual female and Ronnie Garford was in drag. Moving along, then, (laughs) you have Julio Fantastico against Too Cold Scorpio. Why why is uh, Too Cold walking out with the big gold belt? Why why does he have that title? Nobody nobody says anything. Uh, Captain Lou joins the commentary team. Because he's had nothing to do with any one of these two in their lives at any point. Uh, This is where Dutch is fed up with Roger Mendez or whatever the hell his name is. And it starts correcting him every time he says something wrong. The, The bonus is 
these two can actually still work at this point. Like, Julio's young. I don't know anything about him. If he went on to be anything else, I apologize. Too cold, still good. This is the most athletic match of the night, but it still made no sense. He went on to play for the Braves for, like, almost into his 50s, right? <laughs> Julio Franco? It might have been. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Did he call his finisher the tumbleweed, by the way? Was it ever called the tumbleweed? Because he apparently he hit yeah. the tumbleweed twice in this match that Roger Mendez or whoever yeah. this guy said. He did a nice spinning move, and then he went for something else that looked like it missed completely. Like, I know you guys can't see me, but it looked like he, he landed too far away, so he extended his hand like he meant to drop a fist on his face. So, like, his if you were to go for a flying leg drop off the top rope and miss and hit your ass, you would sell that you hurt your spine. That's exactly what Two Cold Scorpio did, but he extended his hand... Meanwhile, his ass goes boom, boom on the mat, but his hand makes contact with the guy's head, and that's enough to to knock him out. Other that's than a, that, go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say that's a hell of a fucking finishing maneuver. Screw the figure four pile driver and you know flying elbow smash from the top rope. We'll just get you with the you know the big one game. finger poke from the fucking middle rope shit. And this match was good. This was all right. That that guy Julio did a heading plex, but like hooked the arm with it, almost like a, a Samoan drop type heading plex. I, I to this day have never seen anything like it. The guy could work, like you said. I don't know if he ever went on to do anything else. This was probably the best match of the night. I know we said it wasn't going to get any better, but this was this was pretty good. It it was. After the match, uh, I, I brought this up because it was so far fetched that. God bless Captain Lil. He was named the commissioner, and <laughs> of so many pay-per-views to come, and it was the best thing that ever has happened in his life. You know, not managing 16 teams to tag team championships, or winning the Slammy Award, or doing anything. Being the Heroes of Wrestling commissioner was the best. He He was leaving crying. And it looked horrible. I think those fucking rubber bands were too tight on his beard and hair. <laughs> I think that's what the problem was here. I think he was. I think he was crying because he was, you know, his head was getting squeezed too hard. <sighs> next matchup. The the next. Can we say match? Spit it out. I I can't say I can't even say that this was a match. The next time the four next people time? were in the ring at the same time. Oh, God. The, the next time <laughs> four people touched each other at the same time. <laughs> uh, the men from down under. Or we would know them as the sheep herders or the bushwhackers, but if clearly they can't say that. So the men from down under took on the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. You know the best thing of this match was for me? It ended. Here in Volkov sing the national the Russian national anthem. Because Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov jumped the bushwhackers prior to the match. And I have correct me on this, John, because I'll I'll give it to you. Drank a beer faster than yeah. either one of them could move. Volkov did most of the work and still had something in the tank. And, and this is – it's well documented. Sheik's knees are in bad shape, and they were even then. Don't get in the ring, man. Just don't do it. He had a period of time where he was the shit. You know, late 70s, the mid-80s. By the time he had that brief period in WCW, he was essentially done. His legs were shot. So you see Volkov run across the ring to jump one of the bushwhackers. And Sheik is walking slower than my grandfather at that time. Um, he just didn't have anything left. And that's not how you want to remember the guy. They gave us nothing. This is another match where these guys had nothing. 
they gave us nothing. And I hate to say this, but that's how it is. So I thought, okay, we're going to see the double gut buster that the sheep herders used to do. And then I thought, well, no, I'm watching this. The way these guys are moving, they can't pick up the sheep because he's in terrible shape. Nikolai's still a big guy. We're not going to get that. We're going to get the battering ram. You can't get the guy in a fucking headlock and run him into the other guy. <laughs> something. These guys didn't do anything. Volkov worked the hardest, and that's not saying much. The guy on the outside of the ring was as Russian as Crusher, Pat Lapino, Khrushchev. His accent was just as convincing. Fuck Pat! <laughs> that's it. This was... Awful. And I love the Sheik. He was a legit badass. This was shameful. Shameful for the Iron Sheik. Oh, um, this match, what, we had the Sheep Herders who were supposed to be from New Zealand. But they were the good guys, so they were the uh, Bushwhackers. Okay. So we had New Zealand, Russia, and Iraq. This should have been a fucking international incident, this match was so bad. These countries should have gone to fucking war with each other. This this match was so bad. You know, to get the taste out of my mouth of this match, I had to go and lick a bag of look shit. up look up Sheik's Twitter feed where all he does is call people jabronis and tell them to fuck off. This was this was bad. I heard the worst thing I've ever heard. From Roger Jabroni. Oh my god, he's squeezing him on his neck! Most people say he's choking him. <laughs> he's squeezing him on his neck! <laughs> yeah. Sheik's, Sheik's knees were so bad. Uh, he tagged in. And then he never left the ring after until the he, final match until he until they lost <laughs> he couldn't he just um, on paper i'm going to stop for a minute on paper <laughs> all three of us i would have been 22 john would have been 23 22 years ago chad you would have been 26 26 we would have went to the bars we would have went to this. We would have enjoyed it. We would have ripped it apart then. We would have tried to get autographs. We would have did all this. We would have bitched about it the whole fucking time we drove back from St. Louis, fucking Missouri, Mississippi. Mississippi. Wherever the hell it was. <laughs> we would have been there drunk. We would have been there drunk in the front row, enjoying it for living what, what we thought was going to be great. We would have hung ourselves on the way home in any vehicle that I had at that point. I don't even remember what I had in '99. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the white Chevette. Next matchup is Tally Blanchard against Sweet Stan Lane. This was the match I was looking forward to when I saw this. I'm like, wow, all right. I don't know if they can still work or, you know, I, I don't remember what was going on. The the jump prior to with Sweet Sam Lane throwing Telly Blanchard in the trunk was horrid. But Telly, with the, the reverb... Pumped me back up. I'm like, God damn, Telly still has it. I was excited thinking, this is going to be a great match. Somebody go first, because I fucking hated everything about this. Chad's taking a drink. You both pointed at each other. All right. Well, th this is where I'll say the promo was excellent. Uh, and this is why Tully Blanchard has a brilliant mind for the wrestling business and is still relevant today. Every other promo, when I say it was generic, it was either, hey, like I said, we're brand new and we're trying to get ourselves over, or let me tell you about my history, like Greg Valentine saying, stand up for me because I was great once upon a time. Tully effortlessly combined both of those things. He told you where he's been, 
where he is and where he's heading. So I guess three things. Um, and he made it personal, you know? Um, you were nothing without Jim Cornette and beautiful Bobby Eaton. It's the only reason you were ever a world champion. Here are my credentials, you know, something to the effect of I'm not expecting anything like what we did back then, but know that I'm going to kick your ass. He was like, yeah, okay, these guys are a little older, so I'm not going to expect the same thing from 11 years earlier when, when they did a championship versus championship match. I still expected a little more from this match. I thought it was good. Both of these guys were still active enough that I thought they'd put on a better match than they did. And I thought Brawl afterwards was better than a lot of what happened during the match. That's what I was just going to say. The Brawl afterwards was better than the match. Um, In reading up about this (laughs) pay-per-view... Oh, it only gets better. The, it uh, a lot of the talent was outspoken about what they got paid for this shit. These two being two of the most outspoken ones, and they're like, <laughs> we'd all like to think that they give a mat a good match or a great match, do their best, whether they're wrestling in State College or the Pontiac Silverdome. These guys were like, they got paid, you know, so shitty that their travel costs were barely covered and enough food while they were in the fucking area. And they're like, we're not putting ourselves, you know, go on all out. We're going to we're going to give you this and you can take it or fucking leave it. We don't care. And that's what their attitude. A lot of the wrestlers attitudes were. Because they got paid so shitty. I think that reflected a lot within this pay-per-view. I just remember these two guys talking about this, saying this was bad. We weren't going to put it forth for as little of money. I think they got paid a third of what they were supposed to be paid. People in this match, this this was a match that, like I said, I was excited for. I don't know why they had to show the crowd 900 times in this match. They look sad. In this match. They were showing people and they're like, This lady is so excited for Sweet Sand Lane! She's fucking snoring and drooling. This lady is so excited for Sweet Sand Lane! <laughs> I, I, Nobody you know was excited for Sweet Sand Lane. You know why they were so depressed? They could have wiped their ass with the money they paid on for these fucking tickets and flushed down the toilet and got a better fucking bang for their buck. Uh, the idiot called the backdrop an illegal move that Telly ended up winning with. Was that a legal yeah. move? Why Why was that? A, the referee changed his decision. That's an illegal move. So it was a suplex. It was like either a German or belly, to, you know, uh, like a backdrop suplex. How many times have you seen it? You know, Luger beat Wyndham for the U.S. title. Beefcake beat Valentine. Both shoulders are down. One guy gets a shoulder up. In this case, actually, Lane got his shoulder up, too, and the ref still counted. But it was supposed to be Tully getting his shoulder up. But this moron, I I don't know, did nobody give him a copy of what the hell was supposed to happen? Why is a perfectly sound wrestling move into a pin illegal that that, these guys through the night, you see all sorts of different things. We'll get to, you know, was that Duel the Butcher later? Oh, wait, yeah, yeah. Next. This is what's going to cost a guy a match? Like, you really thought a suplex, one of the most basic moves, was cause for a reversal, not just, hey, I'm going to count one, two, you better let go. But an automatic reversal of the match. It's because Tully got his shoulder up before the count of three and stands were still down. And Dutch Man Todd explained this to the guy. and But that's that's a move that you use in, like, the third or fourth match of a, a series of guys. I, right. I thought it was completely stupid to have that finish in Absolutely. one of their very first pay-per-views. And we'll talk about this whole thing after we wrap this up. Um, why have that match in that finish in this match that hasn't happened in 20 years? I don't think there was any fucking writers. I just think they're like, okay, 
You're going really? to really, really. <laughs> I mean, not. I don't want to say they hired you know a fucking team of writers, but there was nobody that knew what the fuck they were doing. And this goes beyond Ric Flair calling the Matt calling the you know forty five minute classic with Sting. This goes beyond that type of stuff. It was just like, okay, Tully, you're going to win. Figure it out how. And then the guys got together. How could we be the dumbest motherfuckers we can in this match <laughs> and end it? Other than having Sherry Martell coming out with her top off and George Steele coming out behind her wearing it and jumping into the ring, this match couldn't have ended any dumber than it did. I was so depressed. I was so depressed in this match. This was, when I saw the card, I'm like, oh, this could actually be a good match. They're both in great shape, yet, yeah, da, 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 da. And uh. we've seen, 2019, we've seen Stan Lane at the uh, Crockett Cup and signing. Dude is legitimately, looks like he could walk into the ring now. And he's he looks in better shape than, not that it's saying a lot, but... 95% of the fucking wrestlers today. Dude looks cut for his age and as long as he's been out. Next we get a Anvil and King Kong Bundy <laughs> promo, which is leading us to think something's going on. Why are these two do cutting a promo on everybody? What? Why are these two together now? Well, it's because they're both managed by Jimmy Hart in 1985. Oh, I'm sorry. We're in 1999. Yeah. My mistake. Go ahead. But So they don't tell us anything. But they just happen to run each other and have to do a promo. And it leads us, shit's going to happen down the line. All right. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. the word shit right. So the next match is Abdullah the Butcher against One Man Gang. Blood is within the first three seconds of the match. Uh, change chairs. Uh, it's a brutal fight. If it would have happened in 81, this would have been the greatest match of my life. I would have loved it. They went crazy about the fork. And <sighs> the battle afterward was better again than the match. And I don't know if he even counted the 10. Everybody was already accustomed to one. I'm not going to count the ten. Two. I'm still not going to count the ten. Three. You had that pause in between. This motherfucker, they both rolled out of the ring. They both dripped blood on that piece of paper that Roger Mendez showed us. Ah, that's a ten count. That was, eh, boom. They were out of the ring, ten count. Get your asses back. And I'm all right that this ended in a 10 count because good for them. Because I like Abby and I like One Man Gang. Cool. It's a bloodbath. Neither one of them should have lost. Neither one of them should have won. Neither one of them should have been in the ring. Neither one of them should have been in the ring at this time. But I'm just saying, like, you didn't hear the ref even counting. Because Roger Mendez, or whatever his name was, was, uh... Oh my god, he's over here! Oh my god, my 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 papers are getting bloody! Oh my god! Ugh. Um, <laughs> Abdullah the Butcher could move back in the day. He could run around the ring. That was not the case here. I, you know, I've watched some old Watts stuff too. Maybe this was just his thing. The gang was a slow mover. It's a great name. One man gang. From Chicago, Illinois. It is a great wrestling character. Never known for moving around. He was a huge guy. Didn't have to move around very fast. I don't know. Like, you can't drop an elbow on a guy. You can't drop a knee. You can't step on his neck on the ropes. I don't just do something. That's what I'm saying about every match. Like, even if they weren't great back in their day, they had things they did. They didn't do any of it. None of it. The gang was just like, you know, forearm, bang, boom, 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 boom. And there's a pause. And another forearm, boom, 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 and the rope shake and everything shakes. God, put me to bed. I got nothing on this one. Double count out. 
Next matchup is Snook against Bob Orton. Uh, this match happened because they were both pissed about a card game. That happens. I understand. <laughs> this was actually a match that actually wrestling moves happened, though. Actual wrestling moves happened in this match. Stop. As much as they were not... Stop. They were better than any other wrestling moves in this card. An arm bar for seven fucking minutes of a 12-minute match <laughs> is not a wrestling match with fucking moves. It was a wrestling did you, move. Did you guys... So it was a finger poke to the eyes, but we don't want to see that for fucking seven minutes. And Superfly wins. This... I think they kind of threw it back to it was the exact same finish when Orton broke his arm, I think. Like, he ran into the corner and snuck a move, and he crashed his arm in the corner, and then snuck a hit the sunset flip into the ring. They did the exact same thing from their 85 match, which is what caused Ace to have to wear a cast for two years. Poor guy. This was... It was just a... Uh, it was a joke on something that happened 15 years earlier. Like, hey, let's laugh at that. That's all it was. It's It was a raw reunion show of a match. <laughs> the next three things that happened just brought this pay-per-view from a five-card match to nothing. No, I'm kidding. You had the Jake promo. I got it. If you didn't know the Jake the snake was loaded during this promo talking about Batgammon and fucking Blackjack and 21 and Aces and Ace. Stevie Wonder could have seen that he was fucking lit in this. You want to play Blackjack? I got two of those. You want to play Aces and Eights? Well, I got some of those too. You don't gamble with me. You want I don't 21? accept losing. I got Neither does Damien. Poor fucking Damien. If Peter was if Peter was Damien around was back dead. then, right? Damien was dead at this point. Earthquake killed him. We had Earthquake a different. Killed. Oh, I think Jake killed him in the dressing room pouring fucking uh, whiskey down his throat the one time. But anyway, finally in this match, Gordon Soley gets brought up, and I don't even remember the reference. I just put Gordon Soley finally brought up. But they never told us why he wasn't there. Uh, nothing like that. It, Gordon Soley called this match one time or something stupid. And then everything just went awry because <laughs> you saw the promoter come out, <laughs> which they called Little Bundy. <clears throat> and shit, I don't even know where to go. <laughs> Jake Roberts is masturbating the snake. Then he puts them on him and starts making love to him. You forgot about the lady that was oh. feeling up Jake's man titties. He made her. He made her. When he, he first of all, he dropped the snake off, was in the ring, left, went backstage for no apparent reason, came running to the ring like Sam Houston. Huh? Had his shirt off and rubbed this lady's hands all over his chesticles. Ah, uh, they were just trying to get fucking Jake out of the ring as fast as they could, and they had no clue how. And they waited way too long. I honestly couldn't tell you anything that happened in this match other than what you said. It seemed like he was lost or he didn't want to work, so he thought, "Well, I'll just, you know, do stuff with the snake," but it didn't work. Um, he was a master of psychology in his heyday. This wasn't it, man. This was not it. They send Bundy out to try to save it. Then Yokozuna. <laughs> Yokozuna looked pissed. The the quote from website I'm reading right now. Not long after, this was after Jake was masturbating a snake and making out with it. Yokozuna and his enormous ass waddled down to the ring making this a four-on-two tag team match. Does that fucking tell you how big they think Yoko was at that time? They all were against... All they wanted to do... Because Snake tagged in Yokozuna. He did a move to the anvil. All of a sudden, Bundy comes in. 
splashes the Jake, the Jake, I mean, Jake the Snake, and a three count happens when not one person was legal in this match. Jake gets up pissed off and then starts disrobing and they cut the fucking broadcast because he's started stripping. Uh, I don't know, man. He was out of it. He was out of it. Again, just another match where they didn't give us a single thing they did. The anvil was known for his forearms in the corner, his power slam, shoulder block. Do something, man. Do something. Somebody take a bump on this car. All right. There was a quote here. I love this. There was very little like about this show, and the main event was just a sad sight to behold. If you really hate your own life, this is a good way to fucking torture yourself. Otherwise, avoid this pay-per-view. So we're glad we picked it. All right, let's, let's wrap. Let's give it a rating. Well, that's what I'm going to do. Let's wrap this up and give it a rating. I want John, Chad, and then myself. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll cover NXT and AEW quickly as well. So, John, what do you give this? Out of, out of six beers... A half. I would say negative one, but I don't want to. I don't want to insult AEW, so um, this is like this is a negative two and a half. I'm sorry. Other than no, you have to give it zero to a beer. We don't do negatives. Yeah, yeah. John gave it a half at least. Uh, one tenth. This is like the amount of beer you get off of a cap. That's exactly it. what I was going to say. I want the cap of beer. That's it, not even a full cap. This is like Kelly's there's cap. a couple of fucking drops on the cap type. Kelly's cap. Uh, well, negative one. or ne I'm sorry, not negative one. One-tenth. This is by far the worst thing that ever happened in wrestling. When we come back, we'll talk about Maybe some better wrestling this week. Have you ever wondered what happened to Lance Von Erich? Find out in his new book, Lance by Chance, Wrestling as a Von Erich. You'll also read stories about Chris Adams, Ric Flair, June Hernandez, and Billy Jack Haynes. And, of course, the Von Erich family themselves. Get your copy today at LanceByChance.com. And welcome back, Can Crusher Nation. For those of you who are awake after the shit show so far... Uh, what? It we've is, been good. We, one, what, we have about eight beers in front of we've, us. We've been good, which to say what we've discussed for the most part is especially that last thing. Uh, that was a great... I, it's a glorious guru here. We got Mark the Mark, and we got John the Professor. Uh, guys, let's, let's pick this show's ratings up so we get more than three after that first little bit. How are we going to do that with a, let's just say this. Maybe we can put in a plug for Al Snow's 210th birthday party. AEW and NXT. Um, let's start with AEW, just because. And we're going to run it the same way that we ran WWE this week, because, uh, yep. John, what do you think about AEW this week? Uh, honestly, I, I didn't like it at all. I hated it. I don't know where Dark Order's going. I didn't enjoy their match. I didn't enjoy Cody's match. It just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, Kenny Omega strikes me as someone who doesn't watch wrestling, pretending to be what he thinks a wrestling heel is. There's no heat on that guy. There's nothing believable about him. Um, Moxley's match against Nick Camarado. I don't know who that guy is, but apparently he was trained by the <laughs> Nightmare family. Uh, I hated that QT and Dustin were at ringside. We get it. Okay, he trained with you guys. I don't need to know that. He's in there to do a job. Just let him be in there to do a job. Sylvan said he looked like Hercules. That blew my mind. He's absolutely right. The he did. Chains. Yeah. Bobby Heenan. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, private parties match versus Hardy and or, uh, uh, private party and Hardy versus Top Flight. Um, it was a Seidel. I don't know. Some of those moves just didn't didn't sink. It's like guys, you're doing all this crazy shit, and someone's gonna get hurt, and it doesn't even. It doesn't look natural. It doesn't look real. Penelope Ford versus Layla Hirsch for me was the best match of the night. Uh, I think this told a story that you didn't see a lot of the gymnastics from Penelope Ford that you usually see because Layla Hirsch was using like ground wrestling and holds and maybe Penelope Ford didn't get a chance to use those gymnastic type moves or thought, hey, I better use a different game plan here. Guys, you don't have to do everything every time. I don't know how many times we say this. You don't have to do everything just because you can. Seems to me Penelope Ford gets that. This was not great, but it was the best match of the night. Miro is very funny calling uh, Orange Cassidy a George Michael wannabe, which he I like that. said yeah. it. Uh, and then I was so looking forward to this three-way tag team match. So thoroughly disappointed. It took way too long to get going. I never believed these guys wanted to really beat each other. Not until Hager came in and started cleaning house, then tagged Guevara back in, who did some really nice high flying stuff. Um, were Santana and Ortiz were they even in this match, guys? Because this was all about MJF. It made sense these guys would win. It creates more friction, but. I didn't like a single thing about this show. Not one thing. Um, I'll start from the end and go to the beginning. Yeah, this the six-man match was a, uh, a disappointment, to say the least. They're not going to do anything with this feuding storyline with the inner circle until somebody fucking turns on somebody. Not, not. Oh, he bounces into the rope, or he distracts him. No, there's got to be some. There's got to be a nut shot, a foreign object. There's got to be something to do this. Um, the women's match by far was the best match on the card. Uh, Cody Rhodes having a competitive match with that fucking librarian dude. I was like, what the, what in the hell? Oh, yeah! That was the librarian from their early fucking shows. It's like, oh, my God. Um, His name is Pretty Peter Avalon. Pecker Puller Avalon, got ya. Um, I was I was looking for fucking Marco Stunt in this show. That, that would have made the show fucking better, seeing him. Uh, this was just, this was bad. Um, the only thing that good came out of it was the, and the beach, bash at the beach, bimbos at the beach, whatever the fuck their next pay-per-view is, where, uh, Twinkle Toes McFinger fucking the Good Brothers are going against Dean Ambrose, Phoenix, and Pac. That's the only thing that came good out of this whole fucking show. We're gonna pretty much cover everything, because... Eddie Kingston, we love. We love Eddie Kingston. What in God's name was he talking about? What the fuck was Lance Archer talking about? Nobody knows what's going on. I'll switch to the other big one then. This was like Al Snow booked this show. Worse. Worse. Chad Miller. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sting and Darby just sharing the... The talking bat that they don't know what they're talking. I didn't understand yet what Sting and Darby concept was. They they don't like Team Taz, but they're not on the same page. At some point, we have to find out what's up with them. They don't like Team Taz, but they don't like each other either. Sting and Sting said before. Uh, oh, he! I like him as the, much as I the like leprechaun. You. Yeah, before the little leprechaun Taz came down, Sting popped off that he sees a lot of himself in Darby, and he admires that. And that's and then that that was the only useful fucking thing that come out of this whole thing. 
And by the way, if we haven't said it, which I think we have, you know, happy birthday to Hobbit Hobbs. Yeah, you know what else we haven't said enough yet? Fuck Pat Lapino. Yeah. Because yeah. that's more important than AEW sucked. Yeah. I hate to say that. Because this was bad. How this the fuck was they the beat worst it? ever in my book, AEW. And they still. I was just going to say that. I don't know how the hell they did it. They still beat NXT by over 200,000 views. I I don't know how. And I'm not, we're not going to, I'm not going to be a, a giant douchebag and touch on anything. I'm going to bring it up right now, but I'm not going to talk about anything about negative one, negative one's birthday. Happy birthday, negative one. <sighs> because we'll look like giant ashes saying that that segment was fucking horrible as well. But we're not going to touch on that. NXT. John? Jesus Christ. Pardon me. Sorry, people. So, it kicked off with um, a Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Tournament match. Johnny Gargano and Austin Theory versus Kushida and Leon Ruff. And guys, I don't know if you picked up on this. Does Wade Barrett listen to this show, and is he trolling us? He is. Because he said, I don't know, um, Austin Theory did some kind of high-flying move, and he goes, a giant of a man like Theory getting up like that. And then when Ruff was getting worked over and he tried to come back, he said something like, you're only going to frustrate the big man with moves like that. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's listening to us and, and he's picking on us, but they're, they're – or, or – Maybe he feels like we do, and he's picking on Beth Phoenix, and he won't let it go either. But he's probably on our page picking on Beth Phoenix. Maybe, yeah. He's made two. He made two references during that match to what a giant of a man Austin Theory is. Um, Kushida was a star of this man. He is unbelievable. The lucha style with with the flying in and out of the ring and off the ropes and everything. It's so tight and and concise. There's just no dead air with him. You know what I mean? He hits and moves and then goes to the next thing. I don't know if it's a matter of guys not lining up where they're supposed to be. And and I don't know how many times I have to say this. We really hate picking shit apart like this. Leon Ruff does not land his flying moves. He doesn't. He misses them. I don't know if he's trying to show how far he can fly. But, dude, you're missing your opponent. Big time. He flew out of the ring onto, I want to say, Theory, and and didn't connect. So he kind of had to do, like, the two cold Scorpio thing with his arm out. John, I actually... I, I almost thought this was a match of the week. Almost. You know, almost. Uh, maybe. Um, I love the no-look high-five. I love the way. I, I want the way shirt. I want all of that. My thought was, I think all three of us think that Kishida is going to be the next guy to take on Gargano. Yeah. So let me twist it this way. How about the way winning this match and Gargano screwing over, I mean, Kishida screwing over next week uh, the way in their dusty thing to get that going. Agree. But they flipped it on us. Which might make more sense. Like next week or in two weeks, I think Gargano comes out and they screw oh. they screw Ruff over somehow because they're aren't they taking on uh, these grizzled young veterans? Which I think the three of us have picked to go to the finals at least, right? So this is just a continuation of that feud. I, I think you have Gargano and Kushida coming up. You take Ruff out of this and you put anybody else in, I think it's so much better. I yeah. really do. I, I I don't give a shit if you put in, I don't know, I, no disrespect to Austin Gray, because I love who Austin Gray was prior to Austin Gray. I just think fucking Ruff is... Rough. Y'all know how much I fucking hate Jock Sampson. <gasps> yeah, you fat bastard who hasn't, you know, accepted in two years my challenge. 
You could have put Jock Sampson in this fucking match and it would have been better. Yeah. And John, go ahead. Uh, we, we interrupted you. No, no. No, no, it's right. Another heading plex with an arm hooked, but this time it was like hammer locked. Week in and week out, Kushida shows us stuff we have never seen and acts like he's done it for years. He is incredible. Um, Karrion Cross versus Shanti Adonis. This is obviously a squash. The intro is still amazing. I said to my son, this is what wrestling is. This type of intro, huge rip to shreds buff dude, smoking otherworldly hot woman with him, worshiping the devil, whatever the hell they do, or they're evil personified, and they're the end times. That's what wrestling is. And yeah, what, what did we're going to discover all this in a row and more or less. Um, hey, buddy. What the fuck did Scarlet have on her face this week? That's what I wonder, too. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what the hell that was supposed to be. She, like a Medusa hairdo, but on her face. I. She's come out with so much better stuff. That yeah. soured. I, I love the entrance, but yeah, what the hell? Take that know. off next week. <laughs> um, better watch how you say that. That can... <laughs> <laughs> that could be construed a, the wrong fucking way saying that about her. I all right, yeah, you're right. I remember Jim Ross and, and uh, oh, who just that plastic piece around her head, whatever that was. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, when I was talking about like how satanic they are in the intro, my wife was like, "Oh, that's great. That's just what I want my son to be watching." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's pro wrestling, man. The other thing I'll say about this. The referee it is a squash. It wasn't a, a st- 30 seconds long. The referee did a great job because Karrion Cross decked that guy in the back of the head, turned him over to pin him, and she actually killed the momentum because she wouldn't count. Why wouldn't she count? Cross's arm, he went to hook his head. His arm was under Adonis' shoulder, or when he hooked his head, he actually picked his shoulder up. It was underneath the, the rope. Yeah. Is that what it was? Oh, yeah. But she's like, I'm not counting that. I'm not counting that. And that's the right thing to do. Referees can stop a fight like a guy gets up at seven and the ref still stops it. You don't see that really in pro wrestling. She wasn't going to count unless his shoulders were down. Quick story. When I was in then, Honduras. Oh, crack your other beer because this isn't going to be a quick story. When I was in Honduras, there were jobs reserved specifically for women on coffee farms because they – according to the people in Central America, have better eyes than men do. So in a sorting process of coffee beans, only women do that job because they can spot defects better than men can. My point is this. She saw that his shoulder or whatever, it was in the ropes or whatever. Do you think CJ Sensation would have seen that? No. we no, we, Of course we, not. We speak in the Bobby Williams, the senior IWC referee and he said he wouldn't have seen that that cj sensation needs to go back to camp but she saw it and she wouldn't count she did a good job um up next imperium versus the lucha house party i hated the shit out of this guys hated the shit out of it good you we'll have move along we'll move along because imperium should have won British this bulldog finish as like the second move. We're not moving. I don't know what a finish is anymore. Bubba Ray said, you use one of the greatest tag team finishes in history as a mid-match spot. WTF. Agreed. None of this shit was believable. None of it. Carter and Cotanzaro versus Storm and Martinez. Very good match. When she's on the outside of the ring, the top rope... Cotanzaro. Uh, yeah. When she is. There's four I women in this I, match. I thought we. he said when Sheeta is. Oh, yeah, no. Oh. Now, uh, when Casey's on the outside of the ring, the top rope blindfolds her. That's how short she is. And I thought, how could she make this believable against two women the size of Martinez and Storm? She did. When Martinez had her on the top rope, she tried to wiggle free and did like a hurricane run off the top rope. Martinez did a great job selling that. Cotanzaro made the hot tag, did quick stuff when she could. She's she's tiny, but she's believable. Um, that, for me, was probably the best match of the night. Anybody want to add anything to that? 
Or am I just going through you're, all this myself? Yeah, you're, you're you're you got this, Sean. Just, just, just keep going. When we we want to chime Bronx in. Bronx Reed with a skip we can. We don't have to do every match. Okay. We can just Bronx skip over some. Tyler Rust. Yeah, all right, all right. Tyler Rust. Right. Tyler Rust. Okay. And then I was expecting so much more from Champa versus Thatcher. The most interesting thing to me, I hate to say this, was when the referee was cutting across corners to check on the action. When they were up top, on top of the, I'm like, oh shit, he's gonna fall backwards. I thought the uh, same thing. I only yeah. watched it this morning, and I didn't want to text you about it. I'm like, he's gonna fucking fall in the ring. Uh, it was interesting to see Champa use the desperate techniques instead of Thatcher. That was a nice story. Like he's the one kicking in the nuts. Thatcher looked to be more in control. It builds Thatcher up, and you can't really bury Champa. Beyond that, not a great match. I don't remember the first pit match. When was the first pit match? Do you two remember? Know. You keep bringing it up like it's, it's like your greatest like match June, in life. July or something like that. We all talk. I can't remember who the hell it was, but we talked about, holy shit, like the concept, give reality, but I don't remember who the hell it was. I just remember we all liked it. We did like it, but I, I, I don't think it. this one was not up to par to that one. I, I really don't. Um, Who do I have to add to this? I might be a little excited about Finn against Dunn. I, I, don't, I don't know when it happens. Finn went to Kyle and said, be my buddy next week. I was... Why did, that, why did that take so long? They're staring at each other. There's like 30 seconds of dead air. I think they fucking forgot partners? what they were supposed to say. There you I, go. I don't know. I don't know. The promos were awful on NXT. I thought... I, I was surprised that Martinez and Storm didn't get the win. I, I, I love... I love Casey Cadillazaro. Don't get me wrong. But... I, I was shocked that, but I guess EO and Martinez is going to be a better match, you know. Yeah, down, she interfered at the end. EO that, Shirai did, yeah. Down the line. Um, guys, all in all, wrestling just fucking blew this week. Yeah. Yeah, this was, this was not a good week. If we were in rate this week, you know, one to six beers, this was one. Three tenths of a fucking beer. I'll give it one. Yeah. yeah, about yeah one. It, it's I'll just, agree. Ugh. But we do have some good news. We do have some good news that I stumbled upon. Um, I'll bring this up and then I'll let you guys talk about something first. Uh, apparently, on the eleventh of January, this is how much I'm behind video games coming out. Uh, there was a video game released for the Nintendo Switch called Wrestling Empire. And it is a uh, reboot of, I guess, an app or something like that for uh, you know you know your phones or something on Steam. But it's called Wrestling Empire for the Switch. It's twenty bucks, and they have people named Glitter, Snowjob. <laughs> uh, this random names, and if you go through the roster, you know who they are. Uh, Snow Jobs clearly Al Snow. Glitter is Gold Dust. Uh, two that pop off my head. But you pick somebody in a wrestling school, and you get out of wrestling school, and you signed with. There's like five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten. I don't. I'm just now just counting because I know how to count. Uh organizations that you can sign with and you get money per week and this, that, and the other, and they just keep throwing angles at you. Uh, the guy that I'm watching on YouTube right now is with Al Snow. Nonetheless, his name is uh, Snowjob. His tag team partner is Monty Python. Uh, that's Jake the Snake Roberts. And they are the tag team champions. In his organization right now, well, you we, can, know, we know that's bullshit because I think the only belt Al Snow ever held was the one that holds his pants up. Right. <laughs> he bought a belt one time, so that he might have put that on for a little bit too. Um, 
you can edit the names once you find out who, uh, what it, what's the earthquake's name is Riptide Rush or something like that. You can edit the names and make them real people. Uh, it just looks like a fun smash button game. Uh, it's something I'm going to be downloading and buying here in the near future, so I'll talk about it more. The Odroid's coming back this week, uh, with, once I get it back and find out it's all good, I'll give the guy's name a shout out, um, and I will also bury the motherfuckers that didn't do a goddamn thing for me, but that's what I got on the, the video game aspect this week, but check out Wrestling Empire for the Switch. It looks really good. And in within a month, I'll tell you that right now, that uh, Retromania will be out. And I've, I've already paid for the download a year sure ago. Will. I'm not excited for it anymore. I really am not. It, it's taken too long. I do want to play with Nikita Koloff, though. That's the only reason why I want to play it right now. Animals on it, no disrespect, but... It's taken too long. They've taken my money a year ago. I could cancel it and be a complete douchebag, but I won't. No, that wouldn't make you a complete douchebag. You're already there. Ask my wife. Okay. <laughs> or what, ask, else, what else do we got? Or ask my father, because he's a complete douchebag just like me, because he didn't fucking plow me out this morning. Nothing. I got nothing. I'm doesn't not doesn't John have his segment and yeah. his oh, turn? Shit. And shit yeah, today? we've almost forgot about that. And it's his pick. Yeah. Jesus Christ. This is how we're going to end the show this week. <laughs> I'm you... still laughing about Pecker Polar Avalon. That's one of the funniest <sighs> things Chad's ever said. Oh, my God. Um, okay. So, uh, obviously, we started the show with. Um, athletes and celebrities who have passed away and we celebrated them but one thing we like to do on this show is celebrate uh those athletes those wrestlers we love while they're still here with us in the off chance that they listen in or somebody they know listens in and spreads our good word to them uh the segment is called uh not cheers to being here that's the tagline love them while we have them is the name of the segment and this week I am bringing, as I look over at my customs of Hoss and Jimmy Jack, let's talk about middle brother Terry Funk. All right. So I love how none of us come to the show knowing that it's our week to pick who it's going to be. John has to look at his wrestling figures, which are dwindling down now because he's went through a lot of wrestling figures because we can't bring up any of his past. Two weeks ago, Chad looked around the studio and all the photos, trying to find somebody. Last week, I looked around the studio, and then one caught my eye. I'm like, oh, John's going to fucking hate this one, so I need to do this one. Uh, we know week to week whose turn it is, and Chad will be next week, and he'll forget when we do this segment. I won't forget. It, it is strategically planned. To catch everybody off guard the way I do it. Including yourself. Including myself. All right, so you can start with Terry Funk. Ah, uh, my God, he was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this as funny, something that I just watched about ECW. Um, Terry Funk was one of the most influential and powerful wrestlers coming, you know, in the... Uh, 70s uh 70s and 80s but then when he started with ECW he his his attitude was like I can work with that guy I can make I can put him over fuck I can put him over I can work with him and put him over fuck I really want to work with him that was Terry Funk and from somebody who could have just said, fuck this, you're going to put the title on me, I'm going to win it in 20 seconds, and, you know, beat 15 of your best stars. Terry Funk, he was very, uh, what, what the fuck is the word I'm looking for? Teacher? He, he was a teacher, but he was, his love of the business, he was, he, he knew what he wanted to do, and wanted to help people. He wasn't selfish. That was a word I was looking for. Maybe five beers ago, I could have found it. 
Um, we drank a lot. Very, so very unselfish. My thoughts with Terry Funk, uh, echoing Chad's being unselfish, he also did the promos. So good. He... Uh, we should put him up there with the savages that I like or, you know, the dusties that I like. Because he gave us the who, what, when, where, and why. But he put his own spin on it as the Texas guy. Um, we don't we don't give Terry enough for his promos. He took his own spin on it. His in ring ability was uh, wasn't Bret Hart. It wasn't you know New Jack. It, you know, it was in between that gave you a little bit of rough house, but he did know how to put a headlock on and stuff like that. So, again, I, I echo Chad's teacher mentality, especially once he got to the ECW area. Um, but I always, anytime I think of Terry Funk, he was a performer. Because what he did anytime anybody brings up Terry Funk... A lot of people remember Chainsaw Charlie from that stupid era and what he did in ECW. My first thought of Terry Funk was beating the living piss of the ring attendant to put his hat on Phillips. to take it back. And unscripted or whatever, that made that match more memorable than what happened in the ring. So he was a great performer. Absolutely. He was, he gave the impression of being dangerous. I mean, if he is willing to beat the crap out of the ring attendant for putting his hat on, I bet the fans are maybe a little scared. And, and then he would do that thing where he would run towards the fans too, you know, um, just enough to make you think like, wow, is this guy really coming after me? Deranged. Deranged, yeah, yeah. He gave the impression of not even knowing what he was going to do next. He'd run in one direction, then run in the next direction. But to your point, Mark, that he put a headlock on or a spinning toe hold, could execute a pretty pile driver, um, was taking bumps and wrestling a hardcore style long before anybody knew what to call it. I mean, in the mid-'80s, he's getting slammed on the floor. He's going through tables before anybody was doing a good 10 years before anybody was doing that. Um, yeah. So that's about it for me. As far as uh, I've had some beers too, guys. <laughs> wow. Terry, Terry Funk was a consummate professional. So Terry, we're glad you're still with us. Cheers to being here. Cheers to being here, Terry. We got something that we forgot to talk about. Do we want to talk about the... I don't know what the fuck. My voice really, is going. Really what do you want quick, to talk about? Uh, maybe five, ten minutes. Uh, nope, Pro Wrestling Illustrated's oh, yeah. end of year awards. Let's talk about them. I, I have them on front. Three minutes. Okay, let's just go through them. Uh, we'll, we'll debate them. Uh, Adam Cole was voted Wrestler of the Year. Uh, second place, Jericho. Third, Rollins. Fourth, Kofi Kingston. Where was Nick Aldis? He was champion the whole year. That would have been mine, but uh, Adam Cole really? was a lot more active. Okay. John? Adam Cole is not first. He's third, fourth, fifth, in and around there. Love me some Chris Jericho. No way is he second. I'm going, actually, with Moxley. Moxley brought AEW. As much as I love me some Jericho... Moxley actually, once he won the title, brought AEW to where it's at right now. I love Adam Cole. Uh, Don't get me wrong. Moxley's... And I'm only joking about all this because we have both fun it. I love all this. But, but I don't know. He hasn't done dick. Mo Moxley, number one, I agree with you. Adam Cole, too. Uh, tag Team of the Year. Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish. First, Young Bucks, Lucha Bros, and New Day. John, <laughs> I would, don't know that I would have put two through four. 
may, maybe New Day. I'll agree with number one. I will not agree with two and three. I don't know. I, 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 there's not a tag team. I, we talked about our tag teams of the year earlier, and you can go back to listen to that, but I, I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I'm being a dick, and I, I, I think Sasha and Bailey did a little bit more. <laughs> All right. Match of the year. Uh, this one is wrong, so we're gonna skip that. That didn't. That did not happen in this year. That happened in 2019. Uh, most hated wrestler of the year. This one is like, what the fuck? King Corbin first, Brock Lesnar, Shane McMahon, and MJF. What? Who the fuck voted on Shane McMahon? Why did anybody vote for King Corbin? Yeah, this was like, I don't, this was one that I, I didn't get now looking back over it. Don't, didn't get that one. I, I mean, the beginning of the year, Corbin had some stuff, but he's been relegated to, no disrespect to Cesaro and Sheamus and those guys. Bitch that he, duties? That, 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 yeah, that he had some business with, but. I I didn't ever get behind Corbin like Soup Geist did, but hmm, yeah, this PWI was... is wrong. Yeah, All right. Most popular. Um, wow, I'd like to generally I'd like to go with this one, but uh, Becky Lynch, John Moxley, Kofi Kingston, and Johnny Gargano. Are they going off of 2019 overall? Because not, no disrespect, um, Becky Lynch wrestled two matches in 2020. Yeah, I don't yeah, get so, this at all. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get a uh, few to the years right there. Johnny Gargano and Cole. Omega and Moxley in second. They Becky. wrestled one match. Yeah. The, the Spider Web Chainsaw Massacre match that was unsanctioned. Hmm. Yeah, what is PWI doing? Um, so I shouldn't buy this magazine when it comes out in like prob- six months? Probably not. Okay. Uh, Woman of the Year. This one really is fucking weird. Uh, Becky Lynch, Tessa Blanchard, Shayna Baszler, and Brandy Rhodes. Uh, again, Becky wasn't around. Tessa... Yeah, she won the Impact Championship, but then she got relegated to not even being signed by any major federation and then tossed under the bus because of her slanderness. So I don't think PWI would want her uh, associated with them right now because the only thing Tessa's doing is lifting weights on Facebook. Who's number three? Shayna Baszler? She... Yes. Out of those three, I think Shayna had the best year. I agree. I, and I think she's third. I think there are other people who should be first and second. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. And, and just because I'm going to be a complete dick, and you guys have hated me for saying this, Thunder Rosa have, has done so much for wrestling this year compared to any one of them. Um, cross-branding stuff and bring in does mission this, wrestling. Does this go to what we talked about before with the awards of kind of wanting to hit short high spots, high popularity versus I, real, I realistic. A, I hate to be a real dick, and I, 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 I love me any Becky Lynch. And I think the man's a great thing, but I think when she comes back, she can't be the man anymore. And that's just me. But that's just... They're playing on what you did the year before. I just, yeah, I just think they're kind of, okay. Comeback of the year. Um, This one's not too bad. Uh, Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, Dustin Rhodes, and Sasha Banks. I can agree with all of those. That's not bad. Yeah. I'm all right with those. Reigns, 
Reigns coming back and being a dick and being so popular, eh, yeah, that one's not too bad. Most improved. Uh, this one's kind of... Ricky Starks, period. Oh. Brian Cage, Jay White, Buddy Murphy, and Shorty G. Ricky Starks. Hmm. I'm done. Yeah, I don't... I can't debate yours. I, I think you could throw Cage in there. Cage is in there. Um, because I like Jay White and watch a lot of New Japan. Um, I could say he could be in there, but... Eh. John, anything? Who was before Buddy Murphy, did you say? Uh, Jay White was two and Brian Cage was one. I'm not going to lie and say I know who Jay White is, but I can agree with the rest of that. Inspirational Wrestler of the Year, Roman Reigns, yeah. Kofi Kingston, PCO, and Becky Lynch. We're pulling it. We're, we're just pulling it heartstrings on this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not seeing same thing. Uh, last one that's of any relevance, uh, Rookie of the Year, which this makes absolutely no sense, Brian Ella Pillman Shea. Jr., Ella Shea, Jessamine Duke, Ella Shea, <laughs> Utami Hayashida, Ella Shea, and Green Ant. Who the fuck is Green Ant? Ella Shea. Okay. Yeah, this is weird. Um, a lot Come of these were, yep. Anything on this, John? He's drinking a beer. John's finishing uh, his beer. So. Yeah. Weird shit from PWI. Guy. Oh, and the Stanley Weston. Stanley Weston. What is he famous for, guys? I, In wrestling. Come on. The apartment wrestling that we always used to see on the covers of... How the hell Ant's? do you know that? Because I, Cornette talked about it with this fucking award. I'm out of beer. Early in the thing. I'm... Oh, uh, Cornette talked about he is famous because he this wanted is going to longer than we thought, guys. He had a uh, had a controlling interest in a lot of the magazines, and he wanted he was going for the Jerry Springer shit. You know, I think he's Vince Russo's dad. Um, the apartment wrestling shit that we used to see in all the magazines that was him, and it was his son shooting it, and ladies, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a stretched fucking term in more ways than one, uh, ladies that he hired to do these shoots. Meanwhile, we got Bruno San Martino, Bob Backlund, all the other great wrestlers on the inside in a blurb, but we got, you know, TNA McTitty Cup wrestling in a, you know, couch versus recliner match. Um, yeah, that was Stanley Weston. And, you know, of all the things the wrestler who won this oh my God. is thankful for, and all the accolades, winning this award is top-notch. Fucking throw everything else away. Steve Austin. I have no fucking clue what Chad just talked about right there. Yeah. None. Anyway, PWI, yeah, you, I think, Screwed the pooch. You're like you you're saying. not you're not far from this fucking pay per view that we talked about earlier, a Young Bucks match or a Kenny Omega match. You're like a fucking combination of all three. Well, we 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 really sucked this week. This is bad. This is a bad week. Yeah, John. Good luck coming up with the title for this shit show. Because John shit James show. John names every title. Guys, if you don't know that, John names every title. Yeah, names every show. Tough. Why don't we just say f Fuck Pat Lupino can be the title. I don't even know how to end this. I'm going to end it right now. So remember, boys, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot. Apparently, Chad doesn't get to say a goddamn thing this week.